All right, so for this video, I'm going to go over the tutorial. Um, there's three cases that we look at for the development of the heart. Uh, so for the first one, what you have is uh, there's a 30-year-old female. So Mary's a 30-year-old female. She's just got in a back bicycle accident, and she now has a fractured uh, tibia and fibula. So that requires surgery to stabilize the fracture. And after surgery, three days later, you get uh, thrombus in the legs. So there's basically a clot in the leg in one of the veins, so venous thrombus. And then uh, three days later, you see she shows up with signs of acute uh, confusion. Uh, you see that she has, she has paralysis on the right side of her face. And then there's hemiplasia, which is uh, basically weakness on one side. So it would also be weakness on the right side. Uh, for the entire body. So that's a classic sign of stroke. So we can reason that this thrombus has actually moved from the vein all the way up to the brain and caused a stroke in the, I think it was the middle coronary artery. So how does it actually go from the vein up to the brain, right? So if you draw out the circulatory system, so here's the heart, um, and you got the pulmonary circulatory system. And then you got the, uh, the body circulatory system. And it goes up to the brain, right, up here. So if the legs are down here and the clot is here in one of the veins, you'd expect it to go up the inferior vena cava right, go into the right side of the heart, and then um, up into the lungs, and then once it reaches the lungs and it goes into the capillaries there, you'd expect it to get caught, and that would be cause a pulmonary embolism. So that's called, that's what happens in uh, venous thrombosis. Um, if you have arterial thrombosis, so depending on where the clot is, uh, what you would see is it would end up flowing and then it, what, it would usually get caught in one of the capillary beds. So um, the worst case scenarios are where it goes up to the brain and gets caught in the brain, uh, which causes a stroke. Or if it gets caught in one of the coronary arteries that go into the heart and it causes a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. Uh, so in this case, you're wondering how does it end up up in the brain? And uh, so this is... There's a third case, so there's venous uh, thrombosis, there's arterial thrombosis, and then the last one is paradoxical uh, thrombosis, or paradoxical embolism. And so what actually happens is this clot, as it goes, it goes up the inferior vena cava into the right side of the heart, but there's some kind of septal defect. There's basically a hole either in the, uh, the atrium, the, uh, the atrial septum, or the ventricular septum. And so this clot can actually travel across from the right side to the left side. And then when it's pumped up the aorta, it would have been pumped up into the brain and caused a stroke. Uh, so how did this uh, deformation occur? Basically, during development, um, either there's a couple of ways in which it occurred. But basically, during development, um, as the heart was developing, the membrane didn't completely close off between one of the septums, or what could have happened is the foramenal valley never actually uh, shunted closed during birth. And why would this not have been detected before now? Like, she's 30 years old. Uh, the reason for that is basically a lot of times these go undetected because uh, there's not that many signs that there is a uh, uh, septal defect. Because when the left heart is pumping, right, it's higher pressure in the left heart, so oxygenated blood will just be going back into the right side of the heart and then back, um, and then back into the pulmonary system. So there's not actually a mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood um, going through the whole systemic system. So it actually doesn't have that much impact on uh, the person's development. So it can go undetected for quite a while. What you, what you can see over time is that because it's going back into the right side of the heart and uh, depending where it is and how big it is, uh, it can cause more, um, more pressure in the uh, pulmonary arteries 
And uh, this can put strain on the right side of the heart. Uh, this extra pressure on the right side of the heart ends up being with uh, right-sided uh, hypertrophy. And this hypertrophy will actually, over time, the right side will get stronger than the left side. And when that happens, you get, usually the blood's going from left to right, from oxygenated to deoxygenated. If it switches, once the right side gets strong enough, and it goes right to left, you get a right-left shift, they call it, and uh, the blood actually, deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart starts mixing into the left side of the heart and then flowing through the circulatory system. And that's when you actually start to see hypoxia. Okay, so for the next case, you got Charlie. So Charlie is a newborn. Um, and so full-term newborn, 40 weeks old when it's born, 40 weeks gestation, and... Um, so there, there really is no concern. Uh, the, ba the infant looks like it's developed fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with any of the systems. And so it's born in a low-risk environment, or low-risk uh, birthing center. But once it's born, immediately after it's born, um, the infant has nasal flaring. Uh, you can see that it's struggling breathing. Um, it's the cyanotic, so it's blue because it's not getting enough uh, oxygen. So, all these symptoms are classic signs of respiratory distress syndrome. Respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, so what causes respiratory distress syndrome? Basically, when the infant is first born, the lungs are filled with fluid, and they have to expand, right? And so, to expand, uh, you have to break, there's a surface tension on all the alveoli filled with fluid. And so... The alveoli is actually, they secrete surficant. And these, the surficant is uh, secreted by um, type 2 pneumonocytes, so the type 2 cells in the lung. Pneumonocyte. So it's secreted in the lungs and it basically reduces the surface tension and so it allows the lungs to expand uh, during birth. And so in this case, uh, because the infant is not producing surf uh, enough surf surficant, basically the lungs can't expand, and so it's having trouble breathing. Uh, so an infant in this case, it would have to be put into intensive care. Uh, I think it's given bovine surficant, and once the lungs fully develop and actually uh, expand, the infant should be quite all right. There shouldn't really be any other concerns. Um, so they do genetic testing on the infant, and what you see is it has a deficiency in the ABCA gene, or ABC3 gene. Um, and so this gene has actually been shown as it's a transporter, um, and it's transcribed in, it's expressed in type 2 pneumonocytes. So what it's believed to do is it actually brings in lipids uh, to be converted to surficant. So basically this infant cannot produce uh, surfactant, and uh, that's what's causing the defect in that infant. So once it's treated with surfactant and the lungs expand, uh, the issue shouldn't be as big. In the last case, what you got is you got a nine-day-old uh, infant, and basically the ductus arteriosus does not close off. It's a patent ductus arteriosus. Arteriosus. So it's a patent ductus arteriosus, so it's still open. Um, and in this case, this can actually, when does this, like this usually actually happens when in like preterm infants or underdeveloped infants, so that when they're born, um, the lungs don't actually fill up with enough oxygen to release enough uh, radiokinins, which would cause vasoconstriction of the ductus arteriosus. If it, uh, so it doesn't close off. Um, so what you'll see in this infant is that when the heart is pumping, um, 
you got the aorta here, you got the pulmonary artery to the lungs. What you see is that the blood will be flowing back from the aorta through to the pulmonary, back to the pulmonary circulatory system and going through the pulmonary circulatory system. So what you'll see in this case is that there'll be pulmonary hypertension and what you often, what often is a telltale sign of this kind of uh, a patent uh, ductus arteriosus is that you'll see um, a bounding pulse. So the heart has to work a little harder basically to get enough blood to go through the circulatory system and because when the heart, so the ventricle contracts and it gets high pressure and it's actually contracting a little bit harder to make sure that it gets, because some of the blood is getting shunted back this way. But after the heart actually relaxes, there's one more way in which the heart, the, the blood can go away. So you actually see, you'll see a higher uh, systolic pressure. So the high systolic and you'll see a low diastolic because um, you'll need a higher pressure to pump it through, but then as soon as the, the ventricle relaxes, this pressure will drop very quickly. So the, the high systolic and uh, a low diastolic. Um, so in infants like this, what you'll see is uh, they, it's usually not too concerning because you have oxygenated blood going back into the pulmonary system. And uh, so what it can cause is it will cause pulmonary hypertension in the lungs. So that extra hypertension in the lungs, there's extra pressure in the capillary beds and uh, that pressure can actually uh, prevent the lungs from fully expanding and uh, so that can prevent, that's, that's what causes the respiratory uh, distress from these lungs. But you still are getting quite good uh, oxygenation so what's, uh, the infant will usually just have a higher calorie output and so you'll see that the infant does not grow as well. Uh, over time though, because of this higher, uh, the pulmonary hypertension, the right side of the heart, though you'll see right-sided hypertrophy. So you get right-sided hypertrophy, so the right side will end up getting bigger than the left side. And once uh, the right side gets bigger than the left side, once again you'll see right side, um, right-sided shift, so the blood will start going. Right now, the blood is flowing from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. It'll start flowing from the pulmonary artery to the aorta, and in that case, it's deoxygenated blood mixing with the oxygenated blood, and then that's where it's a concern. you got to close it off. Okay, so in what cases would you actually want the ductus arteriosus open? Um, basically, there's a... There's a there's a um, array of like uh, cardiac defects, which are known as a translocation of great vessels. So there's translocations of great vessels, and uh, so this is basically uh, some of the great vessels have been swapped during development. So it can happen between veins. It can happen between arteries. In this case, I'm going to talk about translocation of great arteries. So what happens is the aorta and the pulmonary artery actually become swapped. So instead of the aorta coming out the left ventricle, it actually comes out the right ventricle. And in that case, what you'll see is that the inferior vena cava is still going to enter into the right side of the heart. It'll enter into the right atrium, but right away, this uh, the right ventricle is going to pump straight into the aorta. So you'll get a circulatory system like this. And same with the pulmonary system, you got the pulmonary veins going into the left atrium, but the left ventricle is pumping directly into the pulmonary, a, uh, pulmonary artery. So there's actually two separated uh, circulatory systems. So in that case, if, uh, if the physicians know that there's um, that there's two separated circulatory systems. Basically, it's non-functional if the bait, if the infant is born and uh, this gets closed off. If the ductus arteriosus is closed off, there's no connection between uh, the oxygenation that happens in the pulmonary system 
and uh, the, uh, the rest of the circulatory system. So uh, physicians will actually want to keep the ductus arteriosus open to allow the mixing of blood. And uh, so what they do to do that, um, this will only be a short-term fix, but they do it before surgery when the infant is first born, is remember that the placenta actually releases, uh, the placenta releases prostaglandins. And these prostaglandins allow the ductus arteriosus to vasodilate. It keeps it uh, patent. So physicians will administer prostaglandins during birth because the placenta is removed. It's not releasing it anymore, right? There's no more placenta once after birth. So they'll administer prostaglandins to keep it patent until they can uh, do surgery and actually swap out these two vessels.